My guest today on Dan's talks is Vicki Schnecks, who is the co-publisher of Dan's papers uh, and uh, is all, she's also the, the president of Schnepps Media. And um, I was delighted to meet her. I'm sort of semi-retired and as, as people know, and uh, she bought uh, Dan's uh, about a year and a half ago. So I've come to know her quite well. And um, what I found was that um, she and I have very similar his stories to tell. And uh, I want her to tell hers first. It's about how you got into publishing and uh, how it grew. Well, welcome to uh, Dan. I'm so happy to be here with you and thrilled that you are now a much more vital part of Dan's papers after a semi-retirement, which pulled you out of retirement and we're pulling you back uh, into this uh, busy world of media. And uh, to be here with you today is my honor. Uh, the only thing I ever wanted from the seller was to meet you. Oh. And, and so that was my joy when we met. I think we both fell in love with each other. So it has been a, a great relationship yes, since then. Could have been so, awful. No, it could have been awful. Well, it certainly was joyous. That's yes. put it mildly to be joyous about having a media outlet that you can uh, love the people you work with, respect the people you work with. And to have an icon like uh, you, Dan, um, part of my world is my gift, to, is a great gift to me. Nice. So, you know, I, I wanted to share with you, I think one of the reasons we fell in love with each other is because we both understand that we started with nothing and built it into something. Tell me, and tell me the, about how you started your nothing. Well, you know, um, I was a young mother. It took me five years to get pregnant. And finally, I got pregnant with Lara. And uh, when she was born after a difficult uh, delivery, uh, she turned blue in the nursery. And although she was discharged that she was fine, she started having seizures. And I began with my husband, Murray, the journey to find why she was having seizures. And from there, when we were told that she will always be a three month old, she had suffered irreparable brain damage at birth. Uh, then I began this year of finding help for her. And that was, uh, she was born in 68. And um, in those years, there were very few programs in the community to help children who were so profoundly uh, disabled. So Laura couldn't uh, sit up, she couldn't feed herself, she had to be diapered, she needed total care. Uh, but I'm an optimist by nature, and I kept, and my husband was too, searching for help. And we found a place on Willowbrook, I call Willowbrook State School on Staten Island because they had just built an infant rehabilitation center, the only one of its kind in the whole New York City region. And so with great trepidation and a little bit of um, uh, tears and a lot of fear and hope, uh, we brought Lara to Willowbrook. And at Willowbrook, you know, with the programming for therical, physical therapy and occupational therapy, we thought that there was a chance that maybe something would help her to develop. And um, I lived in a community in Bayside in uh, Queens, New York. And they had wonderful, it was a vertical community of apartment buildings. And in those days, the uh, women, all college graduates were doing work for causes, not working work. So they came to me and they said, well, you know, we'd love to start an organization to do volunteer work at Willowbrook. And so we started WORC. It was the Women's Organization for Retarded Children. And we literally went every weekend sending volunteers and raising money. But within the year, the state funded program budget was slashed. And my lovely ladies and I became marchers and picketers demanding wow. the return of the funds. Wow. And at the time, um, you know, not many media outlets were listening, but there was a cub reporter by the name of Geraldo Rivera who um, had heard about this from a doctor friend at his at Willowbrook. And Geraldo came with his cameras, literally snuck in in the middle of the night and ca carried over his video the pictures of the people who were in one of the dorms with some of them on the floor, half naked. And I'll never forget what he said. He said, I could tell you the show you the sounds, I could show you the pictures, 
but how do I describe the smells? And that story became resonated with the public and Geraldo asked me and my husband Murray to be the spokesperson for the parents. So I was on TV with him almost every week. And then, of course, you know, Barbara Walters chipped in once and Sue Simmons chipped in once and Bill Boggs chipped in once. But Geraldo really played the story out. And so I really saw the power of the press and it really galvanized our city. And for us, uh, Murray was a lawyer and he filed with the Parents Association. My parent, my association, WRC, was friends of people with special needs. Murray galvanized the Parents Association and we filed a federal class action lawsuit. That class action lawsuit, we ultimately won and Willowbrook was closed down. Wow. And all the group homes that exist today in the community came out of our Willowbrook consent decree that these people who came out of Willowbrook had to have a home and a program. And that's how the people with developmental disabilities got to be in the community. And we opened, we found a house. We, Geraldo was busy raising money. He did a concert at Madison Square Garden with wow. John Lennon and Yoko Ono. Wow. And we got some of that money and we bought a house in Little Neck and then the neighbors sued us. Wow. And I had death threats. How dare you open? I had to take my Schnepp's license plates off the car. How dare you open this group home in our beautiful neighborhood? And so we were sued. And the lawsuit was that we should not be in a residential neighborhood with a group home. But we won that lawsuit. And so funny, Dan, you know, we see this happening where people object to something. And then we had an open house. Mm. And the house in Little Neck was named the Geraldo Rivera Group Home. And when we had the open house, the people mm. came around and said, oh, gee, this is very nice. I didn't know this is what you were talking about. <laughs> <laughs> so seeing is believing. And now that organization I started in my living room with my lovely ladies operates 50 group homes and serves over a thousand people in day programs. Wow. So, you know, at that time I said, well, you know, I had my master's degree in teaching. I was going to be a teacher my whole life. Yeah. I was going to live in a nice little house with a white picket fence and teach. And my <laughs> husband was a lawyer and he was going to do his lawyering. But Lara turned our lives upside down. And I had that experience with Geraldo. And I said, you know, I would love to be in the news business one day and have an effect like Geraldo did. Because his coverage is really what propelled the lawsuit and propelled the movement. And so um, I had three more children. And um, about uh, less was in the early 70s. In 1985, I met a man who took a buyout from the Daily News, John Toscano. And he had started a paper in Astoria. And I lived in Bayside. And that's one is in the north and one is, you know, the east. And I said, you know, John, with 1985, there was a tremendous movement. The law changed and all the rental buildings were going co-op. And I believed that if you own your apartment, or you own your home, then you care about your neighborhood. You're invested literally and physically and phys financially in your neighborhood. And you've got to know your neighborhood news, what's happening. Right. So he said, you think you could sell a few ads? I said, well, yes, I'm going to ask my real estate broker who sold me my house. I'm going to ask the woman who does my hair. I'm going to ask my brother, my mother, my sister, my cousin. Mm -hmm. <laughs> And uh, we we um, took every picture. We took every wrote every story. And um, I have to tell you one last piece of my very first issue because you will love this. What happened was is we take our writings to a typesetter, and the typesetter laid out the paper for us on boards in those days. And right. you take the board to the printer. And John said, "Do you want to go to Long Island City and watch it off the presses?" And I said, of course, and this is two o'clock in the morning, right? Because we'd have a, we couldn't get the deadline right. <laughs> so our first issue had to be perfect. So we go to the presses with our boards and they bring me the first run off the web presses. You know, these like in the movies, these enormous presses buzzing away. And I look at my front cover and I see, oh, my God, the baby on the front cover is a black verb. And I swam out. Stop the presses! Stop the presses! <laughs> and they did. And fortunately, we had the photo in the car. 
And John went back to the car. They brought the photo back to the press room. The pressman shot the photo over, shot a new plate, plated the presses. And about an hour or two later, they bring me, a, it's just been about three o'clock in the morning, a first run. And I said, okay, it's a run, go for it. And that's how I was born. Yes. And you expanded that dramatically. And uh, today uh, I'm, Dan, I'm proud to be part of Schnepps Media, which owns that you have built on 89 media outlets in the city of New York, including dailies. You own the- Also, uh, I, I can't let a, my family magazines go to Rockland and Westchester. And then we own a daily in Philadelphia. And then we own uh, a monthly dance papers, Palm Beach. Thank you very much. Yes. <laughs> so we're in Palm Beach too, which is a wonderful place to be, Palm Beach County. And and then you uh, came out and bought a house out here. I, I think you felt it necessary with uh, having been involved with this to do that and become even uh, stronger and, and and better out here. And, uh, well, I'm very proud to be an owner of the house. You're going to get a kick out of this, Dan. You really should do a fun story about it. I live in a town called Queog. Right. And people say to me, oh, you mean Quag? I said, no, I mean Queog. Oh, I never heard of Queog. <laughs> so right. I have to explain to them that it's between Quag and West Hampton Beach. It's a hamlet called Queog. But they all correct me. They think I they know better where I, <laughs> than I do where I live. <laughs> The best kept secret on Long Island. Well, uh, when we first met, we discussed this, and I described what had happened to me at that time. And I, um, I was interested in high school and college, and among other things, I was, I was in the uh, drama club and things like that. But I was also, I also was in, in the newspaper in high school in New Jersey, and my family moved out to Montauk, and I fell in love with Montauk. I thought it was a gorgeous place. And um, it was having a sort of an, uh, a fight with the neighboring village, which was East Hampton. East Hampton was a, a very staid community. Um, had a New York City summer colony that was, uh, I think was very exclusive and didn't, uh, didn't want other people to be part of it. And they had imbued the local village to take that position. And I remember the East Hampton Star used to make comments in their papers disparaging Montauk, which at that time was a motel uh, headed just before I got there, like three years earlier, 35 motels were built in one year in Montauk. Mm -hmm. And there had never been any before and the town was shocked. And I worked for my dad. He moved us out there to be, uh, I was a teenager and he, he moved us out of there, out there because he'd bought a drugstore. He was a pharmacist and he bought a drugstore in Montauk. And I worked for him, but I didn't like being inside and I didn't like being in a store and all that. And I fell in love with the, uh, some of the locals who were rum runners in the 1930s and were telling me these wonderful stories about being chased around by revenuers and, uh, I said, someone should tell these stories and also we should do something about it. having, uh, at, uh, for the same reason you did, uh, having this town represented as you're part of the community, having a newspaper in the town. And that's how I started Dan's paper. So uh, I was, uh, I was in, go off to college and in the summer, it's only a summer community back then. I went to, for the winter, I came home and I made a dummy of what I thought the paper would B, I was going to call it uh, the Montauk uh, Frontier because Montauk had no curbs, it had no sidewalks. It was a very, there were horses in town because it was a ranch out of town. And it was just a windswept, wonderful resort in the summer. And uh, I call it the Montauk Frontier. And then uh, Jack Kennedy uh, created the new frontier for the government. I said, well, it can't be the frontier then. So I changed it to pioneer. And soon I, I found that I could make half a living doing that in the, in the summer. And then in the winter, what would I do? And I didn't know. And my dad said, why don't you start a paper at East Hampton? And it'll be a big success, just like the one here. And he was right. 
uh, at the end of the summer of the first edition in East Hampton, he bought me a brand new uh, Ford convertible, which was a big deal at the time. It was called the Fairlane. It was like a big boat. And I was just, it was 20 years old. And he took me, I saw it was all shined up. And it was a wonderful thing he did. And, and, um, he, uh, and, and, and so I expanded it. And um, pretty soon I had gotten in, uh, to uh, have papers in all the different communities in the, in the East End, in Sag Harbor, West Hampton, North, North Fork, Shelter Island had a paper. And um, we didn't know how to answer the phone. At the, I got an office. How do we answer the phone? We, we could be from anywhere. So I said, well, well, they're all Dan's papers. And that's that's how that Dan's papers was born. And about 10 years later, they all consolidated into one name. And then many years later, uh, you came along. I've been running it over 60 years. And I thought, well, I'm over 80 now. And maybe it's time for change. And that's what happened. Wow. Well, I think, you know, um, I, I believe life begins at 80. So, you know, you have a long way to go yet. And so I think the fun of um, of doing this is what you and I both do is we have fun doing it, you yes. know, the business and we have to run it like a business, but it's a wonderful thing to love your business and yes. love the people that have um, the opportunity for us to cover and to meet and to be a presence in the community. My mission is an advocate. You know, I've been advocating my whole life for my daughter and her needs uh, with special needs and advocating for making our communities, uh, the great communities that they are, and putting the spotlight on them. Not to say we don't look at the problems, but I think that there's a need for good news, too. And the yes. good news is all the people that uh, populate our wonderful towns uh, on the East End. And, you know, for us, uh, the scene, like you saw at the beginning of days, the growth of Montauk and it, the changes in East Hampton. So I'm seeing in North Fork how the North Fork is now evolving yes. and how there are wonderful people coming in there and developing some wonderful pr uh, projects that are great residences, both uh, hotels and restaurants and um, really beautiful marinas. So, you know, I think that for us, I do believe, and I don't know how you feel, Dan, but I believe if you don't grow, you die. Which and towns you. have to understand that, that you're going to have to grow to survive and to keep people there. You know, I, I was thinking about the uh, South Hold, where they have a um, very um, active developer, this John Tibbet, uh, who has built uh, this two Michelin star restaurant. He built the Shoals, which is a motel and a marina. Um, he has this Southampton social with a chef from uh, France, a fabulous chef, and now building a spa. And the old timers are very upset about it. But you know what? These these new creations are providing jobs. Yes. And if they want their children to stay and not leave, they need jobs. And these developers are building quality projects that provide jobs. Yes. So I see, you know, uh, advocating for jobs and housing are my two big projects as a uh, publisher of news community newspapers. Yes. And, and there's, uh, you know, there's a shift now to providing uh, low cost housing for mm -hmm. affordable housing is critical to our survival. Which is Absolutely. I Welcome. can't tell you how many business owners are building their own housing for their staff because they need yeah. staff. Yes. Where are they going to live? Right. So that's that's a very good thing. And, and what do you in the meantime, you've you've opened the branch of dance papers in Palm Beach. Why? How did you come to think of that? Well, you know, very honestly, I think that, you know, our readers go south. You know, when you said people are part timers, more and more have made the East End their home. So, you know, now I see that people are I saw that people are vacating to go south. And I felt we had an opportunity to follow our readers. So I am privileged to say that I am following them and we are covering uh, Palm Beach County. And that includes Boca Raton, Del Rey, Palm Beach, Jupiter, and Wellington. And what gives me a kick, Dan, is that each of those um, towns mirror the towns on the East End. You know, Wellington is like Bridgehampton, it's horse country. Yes. 
you know, I think Southampton is like Palm Beach. Yes. Um, you know, West, uh, West Hampton is like Boca. So, you know, it's, it's very interesting how um, there is a character to each of those towns, like there are characters to our towns that we cover here on the East End. So it was a very natural progression to have us cover. Uh, we're doing a monthly paper. Our first one will be December. And we're doing December, January, February, and March in print. That's, but we that's... also launched a digital platform. So we have a digital newsletter as well that goes out every month of the year. Yes, but uh, I, I should point out that this is our second year down there. You, you, it's not that you, this is the first. It, and uh, Volume two. I hadn't been down there in so long. And I was delighted to be able to go down there I, on a mission with you. And uh, that was so much fun. So I want to thank you for being uh, my guest on on uh, on on my podcast. And uh, I will be I'll be talking to you much for the rest of the day. As a matter of fact, wonderful, wonderful. Thank, thank you so much. Great to be with you again. Bye. Bye. Bye.